Uh, and now I'm going to turn to our final witness who is joining us in person in the hearing room today, Mr. Dan Lips, Vice President for National Security and Government Oversight at the Lincoln Network. At the Lincoln Network, Mr. Lips focuses on research and advocacy between technology, government oversight, and national security. Mr. Lips began his career as an intelligence analyst with the FBI. He also served as a staff member of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, where he worked on cybersecurity policy and served as Homeland Security Policy Director. Welcome, Mr. Lips. You're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Hassan, Ranking Member Paul. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Dan Lips. I'm the Vice President for National Security and Government Oversight at Lincoln Network. As a former HISGAC staffer, it's a real honor to testify. I sincerely respect the members and staff of this committee and the work that is done in this hearing room. We've heard sobering testimony this morning. State and local governments face growing cyber threats that warrant a proactive response by the federal government. But Congress should be thoughtful about the resources currently available to spend on cybersecurity. JO has warned that the nation is on an unsustainable fiscal path, including that the growing federal debt could cause a large drop in the value of the dollar and limit Congress's ability to respond to future emergencies. With that context, what should Congress and the committee do to help state and local governments manage growing cyber risks? I'll offer four recommendations. First, Congress should streamline federal rules to reduce state government's compliance costs to allow more resources to be spent on improving security. For years, the National Association of State CIOs and the National Governors Association have urged Congress and the White House to harmonize agencies' information security rules, which are often contradictory and duplicative. In 2018, the Oklahoma State CIO testified that his office spent 10,000 personnel hours complying with federal rules and audits. That's a year's worth of work for five uh, employees full-time, and that's time that could be spent otherwise on improving in security. JO has reported that OMB has issued guidance to agencies encouraging them to harmonize rules, but did not require them to do so. Congress and the committee could pass legislation to require agencies to harmonize federal rules and audits to fix this problem. Second, Congress should prioritize cybersecurity in existing Homeland Security grant programs, and states should use available federal funds for cybersecurity. I appreciate that members of Congress have proposed creating a new cybersecurity grant program, but DHS through FEMA already awards more than $1 billion in annual Homeland Security grants. Secretary Mayorkas recently announced that the department would require grant recipients to spend 7.5% of grants on cybersecurity. Congress could further increase that amount. But state, states and localities don't need to wait on Congress. They already have billions in unspent DHS grants and other funds that could be used for cybersecurity. According to OMB, states had not spent 50% of the Homeland Security grants that had been awarded since 2015, and $2.7 billion was still available as of 2020. After receiving $340 billion in additional funds through the American Rescue Plan, state and local governments should have resources to improve cybersecurity. Third, the federal government should share meaningful threat information and security recommendations to help organizations manage cyber risks. Over the past decade, Congress has passed bipartisan laws to establish federal programs to facilitate information sharing. But watchdogs have identified limitations and opportunities to improve DHS's information sharing programs. Congress should press the department to implement these recommendations. The federal government should also better leverage its expertise to help state and local governments and other partners implement best practices. For example, NIST provides valuable guidance through its cybersecurity framework. But the framework includes a checklist of more than 100 recommendations, which are difficult for many organizations to fully implement. The White House recently issued a memo to American companies with five specific recommendations to prevent and prepare for ransomware attacks. This is exactly the kind of specific and focused security recommendations that are needed to help organizations manage cyber risk. Fourth, Congress and the subcommittee should conduct a strategic review of cyber threats and assess current and future resource needs to manage long-term risks. The intelligence community recently assessed that technological innovations will likely result in increasing competition in the cyber domain in the future. Congress should forecast what resources are needed moving forward. 
President Biden proposed spending $9.4 billion on federal civilian agency cyber programs in his recent budget, or a 14% increase. In comparison, he proposed spending $750 billion on national defense. Congress should consider whether these resource allocations are appropriately balanced to address current and future threats. There's also significant waste in the federal budget, such as the $75 billion that's lost annually on improper payments, according to GAO, which is much larger than what Congress currently spends on cybersecurity. Given the subcommittee's mandate, you are uniquely positioned to review and forecast what federal spending resources are needed to counter emerging threats. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Lips, for that testimony. Uh, we now will turn to our rounds of questions. Mr. Lips, uh, the chairwoman and I have been interested in duplication and uh, have a bill actually to have reports on bills from the CBO, whether or not we already are doing this through another program. You mentioned that we hand out uh, FEMA grants that already deal with cybersecurity. Uh, in your opinion, would a new grant program just for cybersecurity be a duplication of what we're already doing through the FEMA grants? I believe so, uh, particularly since uh, cybersecurity is an allowed use of the existing FEMA grants. And I think this is an important question because uh, money doesn't grow on trees. We're, you know, institutionally about a trillion dollars short every year just for Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, military. We're, we're short on just the ordinary expenses, and we've been adding extraordinary in expenses of trillions of dollars. Last year, the deficit over $3 trillion, likely over 3 maybe even $4 trillion this year. So we have to figure out how to most wisely use our resources. I was intrigued by your point, though, that even without legislation, uh, we're giving a billion dollars a year. So we've done about $5 billion over the last five years, and yet we have only spent a little over half of it. Has that money been given in grants and just not spent by the recipient, or it hasn't been yet applied for? My understanding is that it's been awarded and that okay. it's with the states and that it could be put to use. Um, why states have not spent that is not fully clear to me. All right. I think that's worth uh, a letter, and maybe the chairwoman might consider that we send a letter asking you know, if the money's been allocated and it's for cybersecurity, asking the people who received it to tell us why they haven't used it yet or what the problem is, you know, maybe trying to figure out, you know, what's going on with that money. And I'm certainly happy to consider that. I think we're going to – I think this depends a lot on what the overall grant is and how much is restricted. Yeah, and our staffs can work together to figure that out. Um, but it's also interesting that um, even without legislation, uh, Secretary Mayorkas has increased the requirement from 5% to 7.5%. So that's sort of, that's a 50% increase in the funding. So instead of $5 billion, it'll be $7.5 billion over the next five years? Um, sorry, my understanding is that it's uh, actually out of that pot of funding, so out of a billion um, it's 5% is required to be spent on cybersecurity, and he's increasing it to 7.5%. Um, okay, so the whole $5 billion doesn't go to cybersecurity. No. It's it's 5% of that, and he's increasing that to 7.5% of that. So it's more like, um, you know, okay, I, I, I got where we are. But the, the, the other possibility is you could even go up even more significantly. We could either do that through legislation. We could say 20% of that money needs to go to cybersecurity. Um, if we really thought cybersecurity was a pressing issue, we could try to reallocate or re resource that money uh, that already exists. Absolutely, Senator Paul, and I think it would be wise for Congress to consider doing that. The FEMA grant programs for Homeland Security were, were expanded and created after 9-11, and the intention was for them to be risk-based and to focus on existing security threats. Twenty years later, um, it's clear that this has become a, a serious security threat and should be prioritized. So it would make a lot of sense for more of those funds to be used to address these, these problems. And well, I think we all agree that cybersecurity is a problem. Putting it in perspective of our overall national security is an important one. You talked about weighing how much we spend on national defense. But also there have been remarks uh, from even folks within the military community. Admiral Mullen said a few years ago that the greatest threat to our national security was actually our debt. So I think we can't, on the one hand, say we're going to throw unlimited resources. We have to be careful about where the resources are and try to redirect resources um, to a problem. If we think cybersecurity is, is a pressing issue, which it sounds like it is, let's take it from maybe less pressing issues and try to force some of the money over towards that without necessarily expending more money. 
Um, you know, I'd probably support legislation if we had legislation that uh, did what Secretary Mayorkas did. We could do it even more, you know, figuring out what the appropriate number is. But you could take some of uh, more of that five billion and, and push it more towards national security simply by looking at those percentages. I had one other question that's kind of a technical question, and I always ask this because I'm somewhat intrigued. Without being a technological or a computer expert on this, they it seems like the articles that you read say most of the um, people get into your system through your email. Um, is that still true? Would half the people be getting in through email, or is that a rare way they get in? It's certainly one of the ways that, that uh, attackers get into systems, and certainly um, it's encouraging to hear some of the precautions that are being taken by the, uh, my fellow panelists. There's a lot that can be done just to, to understand best practices uh, to improve cyber hygiene, such as not clicking on suspicious emails and other measures. To, that it would seem to me that it, it, that it shouldn't be that hard technologically to wall off your email where your email has no communication and you cannot get from your email to your operating system. Can you make it uh, a wall such that it just cannot be uh, uh, penetrated? That's a good question, I, and I'm not sure. I think that there's um, – I'm encouraged by what the Biden administration recently put out as recommendations to address malware and um, ransomware. Um, there's simple things that can be done, such as backing up systems, encrypting data at rest to make it less valuable to uh, ransomware attackers. There are sim relatively simple things that can be done to improve organization security posture that should be prioritized. 20 years ago, as a physician, we used to back up our records every day on a floppy disk, and we would put them in a fireproof uh, safe in case the building burned down or in case you had an electrical surge, you wouldn't lose all your patient data. And uh, I know it wouldn't be on a floppy disk anymore, but it would seem that there would be ways to back this up on a daily basis and uh, protect yourself. There's got to be ways. And so I think a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily rocket science. The, there are available solutions out there. Um, and I think it's important that we uh, get that get that out there uh, for folks to, to, to prevent. The other thing I had heard a lot was that people were doing a lot of more work from home. They'd be working on either their phone or their computer, and they hadn't done the updates. And the updates are pretty sophisticated to protect against viruses, and I'm guilty of it too, not always pushing to accept the update. Um, and that maybe that has been part of the problem in the last year as well. Absolutely, and that's some of the recommendations, sir, that was um, included in the White House's recent memo to companies, update and patch systems regularly. These are basic actions that organizations can take to improve their security. Thank you.